the driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift Part 2 A Voyage to Brobden Nag Chapter 5 Several adventures that happened to the author The execution of a criminal The author shows his skill in navigation I should have lived happily enough in that country if my littleness had not exposed me to several ridiculous and troublesome accidents some of which I shall venture to relate. Glumdalclitch often carried me into the gardens of the court in my smaller box, and would sometimes take me out of it and hold me in her hand, or set me down to walk. I remember, before the dwarf left the queen, he followed us one day into those gardens, and my nurse, having set me down, he and I being close together, near some dwarf apple-trees, I must need show my wit, by a silly illusion between him and the trees, which happen to hold in their language as it does in ours. Whereupon the malicious rogue, watching his opportunity, when I was walking under one of them, shook it directly over my head, by which a dozen apples, each of them near as large as a bristol barrel, came tumbling about my ears. One of them hit me on the back as I chanced to stoop, and knocked me down flat on my face. But I received no other hurt, and the dwarf was pardoned at my desire, because I had given the provocation. Another day, Glumdalclitch left me on a smooth grass-plot to divert myself, while she walked at some distance with her governess. In the meantime, there suddenly fell such a violent shower of hail that I was immediately by the force of it struck to the ground. And when I was down, the hailstones gave me such cruel bangs all over the body, as if I had been pelted with tennis balls. However, I made a shift to creep on all fours, and shelter myself by lying flat on my face on the lee side of a border of lemon thyme. But so bruised from head to foot that I could not go abroad in ten days. Neither is this at all to be wondered at, because nature in that country observing the same proportion through all her operations, a hailstone is near eighteen hundred times as large as one in Europe, which I can assert upon experience, having been so curious as to weigh and measure them. But a more dangerous accident happened to me in the same garden, when my little nurse, believing she had put me in a secure place, which I often entreated her to do, that I might enjoy my own thoughts, and having left my box at home, to avoid the trouble of carrying it, went to another part of the garden with her governess, and some ladies of her acquaintance. While she was absent and out of hearing, a small white spaniel that belonged to one of the chief gardeners, having got by accident into the garden, happened to range near the place where I lay. The dog, following the scent, came directly up, and taking me in his mouth ran straight to his master wagging his tail, and set me gently on the ground. By good fortune he had been so well taught that I was carried between his teeth without the least hurt, or even tearing my clothes. But the poor gardener, who knew me well, and had a great kindness for me, was in a terrible fright. He gently took me up in both hands, and asked me how I did. "'but I was so amazed and out of breath "'that I could not speak a word. "'In a few minutes I came to myself, "'and he carried me safe to my little nurse, "'who, by this time, had returned to the place where she left me, "'and was in cruel agonies when I did not appear, "'nor answer when she called. "'She severely reprimanded the gardener "'on account of his dog. "'But the thing was hushed up and never known at court, "'for the girl was afraid of the Queen's anger.' And truly, as to myself, I thought it would not be for my reputation that such a story should go about. This accident absolutely determined Glumdalclitch never to trust me abroad for the future out of her sight. I had been long afraid of this resolution, and therefore concealed from her some little unlucky adventures that happened in those times while I was left by myself. Once a kite, hovering over the garden, made a stoop at me, 
and if I had not resolutely drawn my hanger and run under a thick espalar, he would have certainly carried me away in his talons. Another time, walking to the top of a fresh molehill, I fell to my neck in the hole, through which that animal had cast up the earth, and coined some lie, not worth remembering, to excuse myself from spoiling my clothes. I likewise broke my right shin against the shell of a snail, which I happened to stumble over, as I was walking alone and thinking on poor England. I cannot tell whether I was more pleased or mortified to observe in these solitary walks that the smaller birds did not appear to be at all afraid of me, but would hop about within a yard's distance, looking for worms and other food, with as much indifference and security as if no creature at all were near them. I remember a thrush had the confidence to snatch out of my hand, with his bill, a bit of cake that Glumdalclitch had just given me for my breakfast. When I attempted to catch any of these birds, they would boldly turn against me, endeavouring to peck my fingers, which I durst not venture within their reach, and then they would hop back unconcerned, to hunt for worms or snails, as they did before. But one day I took a thick cudgel, and threw it with all my strength so luckily at a linnet, that I knocked him down, and seizing him by the neck with both my hands, ran with him in triumph to my nurse. However, the bird, who had only been stunned, recovering himself, gave me so many boxes with his wings on both sides of my head and body, though I held him at arm's length and was out of reach of his claws, that I was twenty times thinking to let him go. But I was soon relieved by one of our servants, who wrung off the bird's neck, and I had him the next day for dinner by the Queen's command. This linnet, as near as I can remember, seemed to be somewhat larger than an English swan. The maids of honour often invited Glumdalclitch to their apartments, and desired she would bring me along with her, on purpose to have the pleasure of seeing and touching me. They would often strip me naked from toe to toe, and lay me at full length in their bosoms. Wherewith I was much disgusted, because, to say the truth, a very offensive smell came from their skins which I do not mention or intend to the disadvantage of those excellent ladies, for whom I have all manner of respect. But I conceive that my sense was more acute in proportion to my littleness, and that those illustrious persons were no more disagreeable to their lovers, or to each other, than people of the same quality are with us in England. And after all, I found the natural smell— was much more supportable than when they used perfumes, under which I immediately swooned away. I cannot forget that an intimate friend of mine in Lilliput took the freedom in a warm day, when I had used a good deal of exercise, to complain of a strong smell about me, although I am as little faulty that way as most of my sex. "'but I suppose his faculty of smelling was as nice with regard to me "'as mine was to that of this people. "'Upon this point I cannot forbear doing justice to the Queen, my mistress, "'and Glumdalclitch, my nurse, "'whose persons were as sweet as those of any lady in England. "'That which gave me most uneasiness among these maids of honour, "'when my nurse carried me to visit them,' was to see them use me without any manner of ceremony, like a creature who had no sort of consequence. For they would strip themselves to the skin, and put on their smocks in my presence, while I was placed on their toilet, directly before their naked bodies. Which I am sure to me was very far from being a tempting sight, or from giving me any other emotions than those of horror and disgust. Their skins appeared so coarse and uneven, so variously coloured when I saw them near, with a mole here and there as broad as a trencher, and hairs hanging from it thicker than pack-threads, to say nothing farther concerning the rest of their persons. 
Neither did they at all scruple, when I was by, to discharge what they had drunk to the quantity of at least two hogsheads, in a vessel that held above three tons. The handsomest among these maids of honour, a pleasant, frolicsome girl of sixteen, would sometimes set me astride one of her nipples with many other tricks, wherein the reader will excuse me for not being over particular. But I was so much displeased that I entreated Glumdalclitch to contrive some excuse for not seeing that young lady any more. One day, a young gentleman who was nephew to my nurse's governess came and pressed them both to see an execution. It was of a man who had murdered one of that gentleman's intimate acquaintance. Glumdalclitch was prevailed on to be one of the company, very much against her inclination. "'for she was naturally tender-hearted. "'And, as for myself, although I abhorred such kind of spectacles, "'yet my curiosity tempted me to see something that I thought must be extraordinary. "'The malefactor was fixed in a chair upon a scaffold, erected for that purpose, "'and his head was cut off at one blow, with a sword of about forty feet long.' The veins and arteries spouted up with such a prodigious quantity of blood, and so high in the air, that the great jet d'eau at Versailles was not equal to it for the time it lasted. And the head, when it fell on the scaffold floor, gave such a bounce as made me start, although I was at least half an English mile distant. The Queen, who often used to hear me talk of my sea voyages, and took all occasions to divert me when I was melancholy, asked me whether I understood how to handle a sail or an oar, and whether a little exercise or rowing might not be convenient for my health. I answered that I understood both very well. For although my proper employment had been to be a surgeon or a doctor to the ship, yet often upon a pinch I was forced to work like a common mariner. "'but I could not see how this could be done in their country, "'where the smallest wherry was equal to a first-rate man-of-war among us, "'and such a boat as I could manage would never live in any of their rivers. "'Her Majesty said, if I would contrive a boat, "'her own joiner should make it, "'and she would provide a place for me to sail in. "'The fellow was an ingenious workman, "'and by my instructions in ten days finished a pleasure-boat with all its tackling, able conveniently to hold eight Europeans. When it was finished, the Queen was so delighted that she ran with it in her lap to the King, who ordered it to be put into a cistern full of water with me in it, by way of a trial, where I could not manage my two skulls or little oars for want of room. But the Queen had before contrived another project, she ordered the joiner to make a wooden trough of three hundred feet long, fifty broad, and eight deep, which, being well pitched to prevent leaking, was placed on the floor along the wall, in the outer room of the palace. It had a cork near the bottom to let out the water when it began to grow stale, and two servants could easily fill it in half an hour. Here I often used to row for my own diversion, as well as that of the Queen and her ladies, who thought themselves well entertained with my skill and agility. Sometimes I would put up my sail, and then my business was only to steer, while the ladies gave me a gale with their fans. And when they were weary, some of their pages would blow my sail forward with their breath, while I showed my art by steering starboard or larboard as I pleased. When I had done, Glumdalclitch always carried back my boat into a closet, and hung it on a nail to dry. In this exercise I once met an accident, which would have liked to have cost me my life. For one of the pages, having put my boat into the trough, the governess who attended Glumdalclitch very officiously lifted me up to place me in the boat. But I happened to slip through her fingers, and should have infallibly have fallen down forty feet upon the floor, if, by the luckiest chance in the world, I had not been stopped by a corking pin 
that stopped in the good woman's stomacher. The head of the pin passing between my shirt and the waistband of my breeches. And thus I was held by the middle in the air, till Glumdalclitch ran to my relief. Another time, one of the servants, whose office it was to fill my trowel every third day with fresh water, was so careless as to let a huge frog, not perceiving it, slip out of his pail. The frog lay concealed till I was put into my boat, and then, sensing a resting place, climbed up, and made it lean so much on one side that I was forced to balance it with all my weight on the other, to prevent overturning. When the frog was got in, it hopped at once half the length of my boat, and then over my head, backward and forward, dubbing my face and clothes with its odious slime. The largeness of its features made it appear the most deformed animal that can be conceived. However, I desired Glumdalclitch to let me deal with it alone. I banged it a good while with one of my skulls, and at last forced it to leap out of the boat. But the greatest danger I ever underwent in that kingdom was from a monkey, who belonged to one of the clerks of the kitchen. Glumdalclitch had locked me up in her closet, while she went somewhere upon business, or a visit. The weather being very warm, the closet window was left open, as well as the windows and the door of my bigger box, in which I usually lived. "'because of its largeness and conveniency. "'As I sat, quietly meditating at my table, "'I heard something bounce in at the closet window, "'and skip about from one side to the other. "'Whereat, although I was very much alarmed, "'yet I ventured to look out, "'but not stirring from my seat. "'And then I saw this frolicsome animal "'frisking and leaping up and down, till at last he came to my box, which he seemed to view with great pleasure and curiosity, peeping in at the door and every window. I retreated to the farther corner of my room, or box, but the monkey, looking in at every side, put me in such a fright that I wanted presence of mind to conceal myself under the bed, as I might easily have done. After some time spent in peeping, grinning, and chattering, he at last espied me, and reaching one of his paws in at the door, as a cat does when she plays with a mouse. Although I often shifted place to avoid him, he at length seized the lappet of my coat, which, being made of that country silk, was very thick and strong, and dragged me out. He took me in his right forefoot, and held me as a nurse as a child she is going to suckle, just as I have seen the same sort of creature do with a kitten in Europe. And when I offered to struggle, he squeezed me so hard, that I thought it more prudent to submit. I have good reason to believe that he took me for a young of one of his own species, by his often stroking my face very gently with his other paw. In these diversions he was interrupted by a noise at the closet door, as if somebody was opening it. Whereupon he suddenly leaped up to the window at which he had come in, and thence upon the leads of the gutter, walking upon three legs, and told me in the fourth till he climbed up to a roof that was next to ours. I heard Glumdalclitch give a shriek at the moment he was carrying me out. The poor girl was almost distracted. That quarter of the palace was all in an uproar. The servants ran for ladders. The monkey was seen by hundreds in the court, sitting upon the ridge of a building, holding me like a baby in one of his forepaws, and feeding me with the other, by cramming into my mouth some victuals he had squeezed out of the bag on one side of his chaps, and patting me when I would not eat. Whereat many of the rabble below could not forbear laughing. "'Neither do I think they justly ought to be blamed, "'for without question the sight was ridiculous enough "'to everybody but myself. "'Some of the people threw up stones, "'hoping to drive the monkey down. "'But this was strictly forbidden, "'or else, very probably, my brains had been dashed out. "'The ladders were now applied and mounted by several men, "'which, the monkey observing, "'and finding himself almost encompassed, 
not being able to make enough speed with his three legs, let me drop on a ridge tile and made his escape. Here I sat for some time, five hundred yards from the ground, expecting every moment to be blown down by the wind, or to fall by my own giddiness and come tumbling over and over from the ridge to the eaves. But an honest lad, one of my nurse's footmen, climbed up, and putting me into his breeches pocket, brought me down safe. I was almost choked with the filthy stuff the monkey had crammed down my throat. But my dear little nurse picked it out of my mouth with a small needle, and then I fell a vomiting, which gave me great relief. Yet I was so weak and bruised in the sides with the squeezes given by this odious animal, that I was forced to keep my bed a fortnight. The king, queen, and all the court sent every day to inquire after my health, and Her Majesty made me several visits during my sickness. The monkey was killed, and an order made that no such animal should be kept about the palace. When I attended the king after my recovery, to return him thanks for his favours, he was pleased to rally me a good deal upon this adventure. He asked me, what my thoughts and speculations were while I lay in the monkey's paw, how I liked the victuals he gave me, his manner of feeding, and whether the fresh air on the roof had sharpened my stomach. He desired to know what I would have done upon such an occasion in my own country. I told His Majesty that in Europe we had no monkeys, except such as were bought for curiosity from other places and so small that I could deal with a dozen of them together if they presumed to attack me. And as of that monstrous animal with whom I am so lately engaged, it was indeed as large as an elephant. If my fears had suffered me to think so far as to make use of my hanger, looking fiercely and clapping my hand on the hilt as I spoke, when he poked his paw into my chamber, perhaps I should have given him such a wound as would have made him glad to withdraw it, with more haste than he put it in. This I delivered in a firm tone, like a person who was jealous lest his courage should be called in question. However, my speech produced nothing else beside a loud laughter, which all the respect due to his majesty from those about him could not make them contain. This made me reflect how vain an attempt it is for a man to endeavour to himself honour among those who are out of all degree of equality or comparison with him. And yet I have seen the moral of my behaviour very frequent in England since my return. Were a little contemptible violet, without the least title to birth, person, wit, or common sense, shall presume to look with importance and put himself upon a foot with the greatest persons of the kingdom. I was every day furnishing the court with some ridiculous story, and Glumdale Clitch, although she loved me to excess, yet was arch enough to inform the Queen whenever I committed any folly that she thought would be diverting to Her Majesty. The girl, who had been out of order, was carried by her governess to take the air about an hour's distance, or thirty miles from town. They alighted out of the coach near a small footpath in a field, and Glumdale Clitch, setting down my travelling box, I went out of it to walk. There was a cow dung in the path, and I must need try my activity by attempting to leap over it. I took a run, but unfortunately jumped short, and found myself just in the middle up to my knees. I waded through with some difficulty, and one of the footmen wiped me as clean as he could with his handkerchief for I was filthy beermered, and my nurse confined me to my box till we returned home, where the queen was soon informed of what had passed, and the footman spread it about the court, so that all the mirth for some days was at my expense. End of part two, chapter five.